City's Great White Way, Broadway. Throughout the 1920s, the nightlife here glittered. Bands played, liquor flowed, and everyone who was drinking it was breaking the law. In the first month of the new decade, the 18th Amendment became the law of the land. The sale and consumption of alcohol was now illegal. There was prohibition, but oddly enough, nobody uh, paid any attention to it. We went to people's homes. They served dreadful things called orange blossoms, which was gin and orange juice. Revolting. And bad gin at that. Liquor was now sold behind closed doors in places called speakeasies. Proprietors took the risks and reaped the profits. It was good money in them days. I was 15 years old. I was riding around with a Nash convertible. We had four speakeasies. One by the Daily News, one by the Daily Mirror. You had a people, you let them in. Okay, a guy would explain who he was and he'd show you ID or something, and you let him in. You got to know it was like family after a while. Every corner had a saloon on it. Of course, you know, they were never raided by it. Their cops were a big part of that business, too. People wanted to drink. So it was a great game. It became a dangerous game for the high-stakes players. Battles between rival gangs for control of illegal liquor territories riddled American cities with mushrooming murder rates. Prohibition's aim was to sweep liquor off the city streets. Now they were flooded with gangsters and guns. I used to carry two persuaders myself. You had to have them, <laughs> or else. Prohibition and the general disregard which followed it was the perfect symbol for the 20s. A decade which was about crossing the line, smashing tradition, breaking boundaries. As modern America came of age in the 1920s, boundaries of all sorts, technological, geographical, and social were shattered. The roar in the Roaring Twenties was the birth scream of the modern. America was now about to leave behind the formative experience of its rural past and embrace the promise of an urban future. But progress would have its price a sudden, wrenching departure from the certainties of the traditional and the familiar, spread by an emerging mass media, movies and the radio. Things that seem old and familiar now were just beginning to take shape in the 1920s. At the dawn of the 1920s, America was clearly entering a new era. An era defined by a vast and complicated urban culture that would dominate the rest of the 20th century. After World War I, there was an eagerness to embrace the new, and it was in America's cities, most dramatically in its biggest, New York, where the modern age was born. The very architecture of the city spoke of America's new ascendancy and her aspirations. The skyscraper was uh, an example of the new form uh, achieving a kind of uh, uh, thrilling 
scale and nobility. More people worked there uh, than lived in the average small town in America. A movement to the cities that had started during World War I accelerated. In 1920, for the first time, more Americans lived in urban centers than in country towns and villages. Their pace has been set in the cities. The city is irresistibly attractive, is really at a kind of high tide in this decade. It's a force, a magnet. The very names of New York streets would become synonymous with progress and innovation. Broadway would represent the best and latest in American entertainment. Madison Avenue would come to stand for the bustling new business of advertising, which was uniting the nation in a set of shared fantasies and desires. And Wall Street came to represent the decade's expanding economic opportunities. Wall Street was where the action was. People came from everywhere to get in on it. The reason I come to New York was there was nobody there after they closed the mines in 1926 in Pennsylvania. There was no money coming there. This fellow Jerry got me the first job. And he said, come on down to Wall Street. The streets are paved with gold. It seemed that way, too, on Park and Fifth Avenues, where the tycoons lived. The number of millionaires in the 1920s jumped 400% over the previous decade. The 20s feeling of limitless horizons was fueled by their lavish lifestyle. Our family had a house at 934 Fifth Avenue when I was growing up. We had a... a place in Tuxedo Park and a house in New York and then we used to come to Southampton in the summer. Everybody seemed to be having a good time. In those days you had lots of help. You had a cook, you had a kitchen maid, and you had a laundress. And then you had a parlor maid, a chamber maid, and mother's maid. How many does that make? Six, but I think there were eight, actually. Terribly nice people. Almost everybody had a boat. I recall in the 20s, uh, you would uh, see a harbor filled with yachts. I mean, really filled, uh, almost gunnel to gunnel. And we didn't refer to yachts uh, as such unless they were 100 feet or over. There was a great deal of entertaining, and it was all done in people's houses, seated dinner parties of 50, 60 people. Always after dinner, there would be entertainment by, by guests. George Gershwin was there with his uh, orchestrator, Bill Daly. Uh, uh, they got up and uh, played on two pianos. Mother always had two grand pianos in the big uh, room downstairs. Gershwin, who wrote Rhapsody in Blue and other anthems of the decades, was profoundly influenced by the new music he had heard and loved called jazz. The capital of jazz in the 1920s was just a subway ride uptown in Harlem. It was in Harlem clubs that one could see the artists at the forefront of this fresh and uniquely American music. Performers such as Louis Armstrong, Bessie Smith, and a dapper young man named Edward Kennedy Ellington. His friends simply called him Duke. music was all about. Everybody else was heading in that direction, but Duke was there. The first time 
uh, I was seized by the music. It was the first time I heard Duke Ellington broadcast from the Cotton Club, where Broadway, Hollywood, and Paris rub elbows. People came from all over the United States to experience what was going on in Harlem in the 20s. I was young then, and often we went up to Harlem at night to dance and everything. We all saved up for months to get the money to go out to a, to a nightclub. Of course, the music was wonderful. Harlem was contributing more than music to America's new urban culture. The world above New York's 125th Street was, in the 1920s, a hotbed of political, social, and cultural activity. It was later called the Harlem Renaissance. The Harlem Renaissance was one of those fancy terms that white folks invent when they want to take a particular look at some aspect of uh, black folks. I don't think black folks run around saying, well, we're going to have us a renaissance or something like that, but it was a holiday of the spirit. In Harlem was born this idea of the new Negro, someone who stood up for the Negro, who advertised his and her contributions to American culture, who was proud to be black. Harlem was the end of the line, the promised land, the place where all our fantasies uh, came true. If I had to choose between heaven and Harlem, ho, ho, ho. Harlem, of course, would win every time. While Harlem seemed a promised land for black Americans, New York's Lower East Side was, for European immigrants, their gateway to the American dream. We were blessed because we were in America. My father came from the Ukraine. He went to work in New York City and worked in a factory where they blocked hats, men's hats. And he was making, you know, like nine or ten dollars a week, working a six-day week. And he would tell me how he was able to buy lunch every day for 12 cents. And the lunch consisted of um, a herring, a big schmaltz herring out of the barrel, and my mouth waters now to think of it, and a big roll with poppy seeds, and an onion, and life was beautiful. This was perhaps the most mixed city, racially, ethnically, um, in the country, but cities all around the country had become more important because change was centered in the cities. Business, industry, culture. Nothing was like being in New York. Just the magic of everything. The world full of things to be explored. That time is one of my feeling of adventure and your life is having a shape to it. Sort of a thread, like a narrative, a story. A feeling that anything may unfold. The decades, startling changes would soon spread from America's cities to envelop the entire nation. Far from the speakeasies and the dance halls and the nightclubs, there was another America in the 1920s. Here, people still lived as their parents and grandparents had, and they liked it that way. In the early 1920s, this was a quiet, easy life. Neighbors would come over what we call the front porch visits. And that's where there would be discussion, maybe a little gossip. Throughout the 1920s, new technologies would transform daily life. At the beginning of